Welcome, welcome, welcome to the chapter 254 review and analysis. In this chapter, we have Kusakabe versus Akuna, and I've got to say straight up, the chapter's fire. I really enjoyed the battle for what it was and how it communicates to us that, through a lot of Kusakabe's actions and decisions that he chooses to make, he isn't as selfish or lazy as it seems. Not only this, but the fight choreography was just great. A desperate struggle against an overwhelming enemy will always slap, especially if the character who's in the struggle has a great heart and is doing it for a purpose that lies beyond himself. With that said, I'm going to break down Kusakabe's character in this fight heavy, and not only this, but why I think Miguel appearing at the end is a great sign for the series. If you guys enjoy weekly reviews and content of this nature, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and now, let's get into it. So we enter the chapter of Kusakabe vs Sukuna, and the paneling here just looks stunning. We can literally see Kusakabe in a circle that resembles his simple domain, and as he prepares his new shadow style, Sukuna questions his action. Due to being one who can just shoot slashes at people, he's like, what the hell is he even trying to do here? But guys, pay close attention. Kusakabe explains that simple domain can erase short hit effects, but not neutralize the techniques themselves. But despite that, a domain is still a domain. Sukuna launches his mantles toward Kusakabe, and Kusakabe is easily able to parry them. He begins to explain that, due to his simple domain that he's open, the output of his cursed energy will be increased, and Sukuna's technique will still be weakened. If you guys remember how Kusakabe jumped in front of Higuruma in the beginning of the Sukuna raid in order to protect him with his simple domain and there wasn't much of an explanation behind the logic of that sequence, well, here it is. Kusakabe then explains that another benefit is his original programming being incorporated that attacks anything that enters the domain via fully automated reactions. I'm sure most of you guys have watched Hunter x Hunter, so it's like Nobunaga's whole shtick. In the strength of Kusakabe's simple domain, it's only reinforced with Sukuna saying that his reaction speed is not bad whatsoever. And Kusakabe is just thinking he's been guessing against Sukuna's slashes from the surge of energy and his motions. Basically, what Kusakabe is doing here is the same thing that Maki does with her precognition. And then another Zenkanto is sent toward his way. He's barely able to parry this one, destroying everything behind him. Kusakabe is doing Maharaga type feats here. I told y'all, do not sleep on him. Kusakabe appearing as he breaks down the technique also gets extra points for style. I might say this a lot during this review, but the execution of action in this chapter is just unparalleled. Kusakabe then points out that Sukuna was able to send this dismantle flying toward him without moving or chanting. This is nothing new, but I believe Gege has Kusakabe say this for two reasons. The first is to remind the audience that Sukuna is more than capable of using cursed techniques without even moving, and second, to possibly hint that Sukuna is almost done regaining his cursed energy or strength back. I believe this because Gojo kind of made it a point that you only begin chanting and using hand signs when you're low on cursed energy, but as of this chapter, he's activating his technique with much more ease. Anyway, as Kusakabe points out that the slash that cuts the world is about to be activated, we enter a flashback. We see all Kusakabe's peers speak about him once more. In terms of getting the job done in efficiency, Meimei and Nanami stand head and shoulders above him. Obviously so. We see what he was doing with Panda during the Shibuya incident, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Rather than Kusakabe always winning to them, it's more like they can't ever see him losing. He's a master of sword techniques with many variations of his skills. He can also use barrier techniques as well, but his biggest strength is analyzation and decision making that's rooted in his knowledge of sorcery. This should come as no surprise to anybody that's been reading with their eyes open, which is about half the fanbase, as Dude single-handedly broke down the Gojo vs Sukuna fight, the highest level battle of sorcery in Jujutsu history. I also like how he's being described here. Gege chooses to have other characters describe him because he's not somebody who'd ever hype himself up. Not only this, Gege has chosen to have Nanami say that rather than Kusakabe being someone that always wins, I can't see him losing. I'm pretty sure that this is because what we're seeing now Kusakabe is not somebody who'd go and fight with everything he has to overcome his enemies from the start, but more so, he's somebody who'd wait and hide until the moment actually came where he'd actually have to fight and defend himself and others. And when that moment comes, he's at his best. It makes him seem like a coward here, but the chapter does more to make sure that his efforts are not seen as cowardice, but rather courageous. I get into more of his actions during the series, but let's save that for the Yaga part of this chapter. Meimei says that he's the person you would take with you to a deserted island. This is because he's so resourceful, and Gojo begins to explain that Kusakabe holds multiple trump cards, one of them being his simple domain. Most would have to create multiple binding vows in order to activate it, for example, Miwa, who needs to have both feet on the ground to use it. But Kusakabe, nah, bro, is just built different. He can complete his simple domain without any binding vows, 
in its range, let's just say that it reminds me of myself. So Kuna catches that, Kusakabe was able to expand the simple domain, timing it at the exact moment you had to expand the technique's target. This fight is for real like a Dark Souls fight, bro gotta time his attacks perfect and all that. You bold if you're a player who'd still attack as the boss is charging though, because most dudes run to the other side of the map when that happens. After Sukuna notices this, we come back to Mei Mei explaining how the new Shadow Style EI is a counterattack upon drawing in the opponent, but Kusakabe will then envelop the opponent with a simple domain barrier, and with that simple domain being programmed to make him attack anything that enters in it instantly. This person who was able to climb up to grade 1 without a technique does not attack you with his brain, but his spine. Do not take them lightly. As Kusakabe moves, we instantly see multiple slashes hit Sukuna's body right after, carving him up. And as this goes on, Nanami continues, saying I don't know a single person who can evade that, although there is one who wouldn't need to. And of course we get the little chibi Gojo mocking him or laughing, you know how arrogant he is. Now, this technique is so dope in the way that it's kind of a twist of a domain expansion, one that is so efficiently made that it can manifest in the real world like a barrierless domain. And not only this, it has a different spin on a short hit. Although yes, it doesn't negate all Jujutsu in a way that a normal domain expansion can, this technique strikes you so fast that you cannot even react to it. In a normal domain expansion, you can at least fight back against the technique or attempt to block it, but within Kuzakabe's makeshift domain, his slashes hit you before you can even think. Bro basically does a judgement cut end here. After this technique, the blade shatters and Kuzakabe throws his coat onto Sukuna's head and begins to throw hands. And don't forget that Kusakabe was whooping Yuji with what seemed to be ease before Gojo and Sukuna fought. But Sukuna uses his left hand that was behind the coat to slash the coat on his face, and Kusakabe reacts by responding with a spinning hook kick counter that allows him to dodge the attack and send Sukuna flying through the highway. Kusakabe follows up as Sukuna is flying in the air, and he pairs another punch from Sukuna and strikes him in the chest a couple more times. And I mean Lord. People can meme on Kusakabe popping off all they want, but when you really look at this chapter, the hands are crazy. This is that type of choreography that comes from an anime studio upgrading a fight from the manga, not the original manga fight itself. Anyways, let's get into where we finally break down Kusakabe a bit. Kusakabe begins to question himself as to why he's trying so hard now. He remembers that it's because of Yaga. A black text box comes up saying that he isn't here anymore. I guess it's precisely because he isn't here anymore. I'm going to presume that all black text boxes are curses from here on out, so in my reviews, I will refer to them as such. Kusakabe then goes on to say that a dead man wouldn't say much, so all I can do is think of what he'd say if he were here. I doubt he'd be bad at me if I didn't fight, nor would he stop me from seeing my sister and Takaru either. He'd look sad though, not because I didn't put my life on the line, but because we wouldn't be fighting side to side. We then get to the conclusion of the Kusakabe flashbacks, and everybody says that he's the strongest grade 1 due to his kindness. Kuzakabe despite always complaining, not wanting to do the job, whatever, steps up to the plate when it's time to protect others, blocking the Uzumaki from Genjaku, protecting Higuruma from the dismantles that Sukuna fired without even realizing that he put his life on the line there and then when doing so, and now this, standing against Sukuna alone, not only because he has no choice, but for his friend Yaga. Even now as he fights what could be his final battle, he's thinking of others and that makes him very commendable. His kindness here and now has pushed him to the strength that he's currently at. I believe that this is what just makes this generation of modern sorcerers more powerful as a whole. They care about something beyond themselves, and when that thing is challenged, they're able to tap into a different beast. Kusakabe says that he needs to focus because if he doesn't, Sukuna will finish off everybody else as he dodges multiple dismantles from him. After landing, he holds his jacket, questioning himself as to what kind of adult he'd be if he didn't charge toward his death the same as those before him and sacrifices his jacket as a medium to summon the blade Moonlight Veil. Isn't this from Dark Souls or Elden Ring? He then attempts to pierce Sukuna, but Sukuna catches it with two fingers and he says that Kusakabe couldn't be more obvious. And we cut to Kusakabe laid out with two slashes on his chest. A valiant effort from our grade 1 hero. Ui Ui pulls up to grab Kusakabe and retreat, and this has me questioning if they have surveillance because why would you just go out there right after that? Sukuna then appears right behind him to get rid of him too, but the screen goes black and Sukuna states that he does not recognize this person, and in typical main character fashion, after his 253 chapter training arc, Miguel arrives onto the scene. He says that if Sukuna doesn't know who he is, you Japanese need to expand your horizons, and the man who stands equal to Gojo 
enters the battle. I think this is a joke as to how you should be reading Chapter Zero. Like, if you don't know who Miguel is, then you need to read a little more of the series. That's just me, though. I have another thing to say about Miguel and another guess as to what he meant by that, but right out the gate, that's what I'm guessing. Now, I'm going to be straight up. I don't know how some of y'all can say that Gege has no idea what to do with the story after seeing this. Do you think that Gege would reintroduce this character if he had no idea what to do with the story? Basic logic would dictate that he does not do anything as risky as put Miguel into this battle, right? Adds literally nothing if he wanted to end the story as soon as possible. Anyways, I'm convinced that those people are bots because they leave the same comments and then go ghost when you ask them to define what bad writing is. And plus, they're the same people that said Hakari vs Kashimo was a horrible fight as it was coming out week by week, but let's move on from that. About Miguel, I'm sure that he's going to have tons of cursed tools or something from Africa. I mean, the way he's speaking here, he's got to be kind of famous. I also want to point out that Sukuna and Kenjaku's plan would result in the destruction of the world. So Miguel would have to show up and fight Sukuna at some point, although I never considered it. I'm sure that Yuta called him up or something over the time skip and let him know what was going on. If I had to drop a prediction though, I'm going to guess he's special grade level. The fit is too cold not to be on that level. And Gege also gave him that Toji physique. He's going to be crazy. Remember, he a lot of punches from Gojo too. And from what we can tell, if Gojo's using blue punches on his own students, he's sure as hell using them on everybody else. So his durability and endurance are certainly high level. But we can only guess so much as to what will happen from here. They could just legitimately retreat too, as Sukuna does seem close to regaining his domain expansion. And if he if he gets that, it's over, right? Let's be real. Uh, <laughs> let's be transparent. If he gets the domain expansion, what are they doing? Anyways, we're just gonna have to wait and see, guys. With that being said, thank you for watching the review all the way, and I will catch you guys on the next one. Really appreciate you guys for everything, and again, peace out.